Okay, today is Thursday, July 25th, 2013. Um, we are at uh, the uh, Archives and Special Collection Conference Room at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And um, my name is Hillary Rink. I'm going to be doing an oral history interview with Faye Allen, who, along with Dell Hamilton, has donated uh, the Archives of Seven Stages to Georgia State for use by students, the public, etc. So we're going to get started, and Faye, as I said, uh, if we need to take a break at any time, that's fine. Okay. And if, you know, am I clear about anything, let me know. So I want to get started by just getting some of the specifics out of the way first. If you could give us your name, your address, your birth date, etc., mm -hmm. um, and we'll get started. Okay. My name is Faye Allen, and uh, my address is 337 Glen Circle, and that's in Decatur, Georgia. Um, my birthday is July 16th, 1949, so okay. I just had a birthday last week. Well, happy birthday. Thanks. Um, <laughs> now, I did see on one of your um, uh, resumes or something that you, you gave us, you have your name listed as Mary Elizabeth. Yes, that's my legal name. And so tell me a little bit about how you, when did Faye come into the when picture, did why did you change it? Well, it's kind of interesting, I mean, to me it was interesting, but my grandmother's name is Faye. And when I was a little girl, I was growing up in her house, and we were both very compatible. Um, and, uh, you know, it was the sort of thing where I was always going around with her and doing anything she would do. I would try to stand on the little stool and do it next to her. And anyway, so I, um, my family came up with uh, calling, by calling me Little Faye. And then we referred to my grandmother as Faye the Elder. And so, and then, you know, when I went to high school and everything, I really didn't pay much attention to it. But when I went to college, I thought I, I would bring back the family nickname, my nickname, you know. So um, then I just started to call myself A. And I didn't change it legally because my mother's name was Mary, and I didn't want to insult her. <laughs> oh, wow. So you were Mary throughout your childhood and then... Well, no, my childhood, actually, I started to be Little Fay, and then they didn't call me Little Fay all the right. time, but Fay. And then as I grew up, I thought that was a, kind of a, like my kid name, right, right, so right. I wanted okay. it, you know. Okay. okay. But then I thought it's a great name, Fay Allen. Yeah. You know, it's a great name for the stage. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your childhood then. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and that's where I grew up, and... Um, I, I felt like I was a very, very lucky person to have been born in, in Brooklyn. I, I was aware of the situation around me, which was multicultural and diverse, multilingual. Um, the food was amazing. And I could go next door and eat Greek food, or I'd go across the street and have Sicilian food. I mean, it was like a really like a paradise. Um, you know, maybe it was a little bit of, you know, a little urban, to say the least, but I didn't know. I didn't really care because I didn't know anything and I had tremendous advantages. Uh, I could get on the subway and just, you know, go to the Brooklyn Public Library, go to the Botanical Gardens, a few more stops and I'm in Manhattan and I mean after school when I was in high school I used to just go to the Met and hang out just because you could, you know, and just then I would be home by five or six for dinner, you know, but it was, there's so many advantages in New York City. Same thing when I, my mom would take me to the theater to matinees quite a bit, and uh, we used to eat at Horn and Hard Art, which is an automat. I don't know if you know it. I know. Yeah. It's interesting. Maybe, maybe explain a little bit. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it, like it's that. a place where you put um, coins in a little glass box, and whatever, you pick whatever's in there. Lemon meringue pie was always my favorite. And uh, then it just comes out, and it's ready. And I, I just saw something uh, recently that they're bringing back the automat. And it was like a wall. Of, a wall uh, of little boxes, right. yes, and and whatever you wanted was in there, and you could just get it. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, I don't know if my mom liked it that much, but <laughs> and so I started seeing theater, um, y you know, when I was pretty young, really, and um, and then I also because I was inspired by that, I also ran a, a theater. Uh, my cousin, my older cousin, uh, who was three years older than me, she and I ran a theater in my grandmother's basement when we were kids, and we would write our own scripts and. We had a recurring um, serial called The Lone Ranger and Mary. And I played the Lone Ranger, and my cousin Adrian played Mary. And we always, it was sort of an improv because she would always get very upset with me because, uh, see, Mary was a nurse, and the Lone Ranger never gets shot. So, you know, it's a really, it's a, like a dramaturgical problem. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing for her to do. Yeah. So um, anyway, but and then we would do like remakes of Sherlock Holmes, and we would. How old were you when you were doing that? I guess I was 
to like around like 11, 12, something like that. And, uh, you know, we'd make our friends come in and pay a nickel. And my grandmother had a, a table very much like this. It was a ping pong table, but it was at least that big, if not bigger. And it, we used to joke that it would, you could have survived a nuclear war under it. It was like mahogany or something. But that was our stage. Oh, wow. So we would be in the basement of my grandmother's house. Which was I want to pick up on that. I wanted to step back just a minute and get a little more information on your family. Uh, tell me your parents' names. My dad's name was James, and my mom's name was Mary. And, They're both passed away, unfortunately. And were they uh, raised in Brooklyn as well? What is What do you know about the background of your family? Yeah, they were, um, my, both my parents were raised in Brooklyn, and uh, my dad was a World War II vet. They got married in the sort of post-war uh, time and late 40s. And um, my mother's parents were both from Ireland. They were immigrants from Ireland. And I actually have Irish citizenship through, through them or because of them. And when I applied for it, I realized, or well, I was told that really I already had it and I was just claiming it because of this. Ireland had this law of um, they felt so bad that they couldn't protect their people from the British. And so many people had to leave that... Um, if you were the descendant of a, you had grandparents who you could claim Irish citizenship. And so I quickly did once I found out. Because at that time, um, I was very excited to have an EU passport. It was a little bit before the EU has gotten a bit wonky, but um, it was very exciting. I felt like a citizen of the world. You know, I could go live anywhere, work anywhere, do anything. You know, well, anyway, with an EU passport, anywhere you can go. So that was sort of fun. And I actually, Del and I, um, we're recently married after 34 years, and this started in 2008. We've had three marriages, three weddings. Um, the first one, I thought we were going to Ireland, and we were going to get married in Ireland, and he would then be eligible for an EU passport. Um, unfortunately, when we got there, it didn't quite work out. They had changed some laws, and what had have to happen, he is entitled to it, but we would have to be, I think, three months in the county, and then he would have to live in Ireland for a year to claim his citizenship. And we just didn't fit in, in our plans to, to live in Ireland for a year, so that kind of fell through. But we, then we started thinking, well, maybe we could get married, you know. And so we did on November 7th last year at the Decatur Courthouse. And then on, uh, I think it was the 28th of January, we had a big, big party at the theater, which we sort of enacted the uh, ceremony again and uh, had a big reception and there we'll were hundreds of people that there. That'll be, I'm sure we'll want to go into that, that later. That would be great. So now, refresh my memory again, I just lost it. The Irish side of the family was your mother's? Mom. So what about your dad's side of the family? My dad's side of the family, his mother, uh, his, let's see now, if I can remember it all right, his father would have been, no, his grandfather was from Belgium and uh, the French part speaking Belgium and um, my grandfather was um, a Scotch Irish, but he'd been there. He'd been in America for for quite a long time. And on one side of his family, um, I have a, a Civil War veteran whose name is Maurice Hull Duet or Duet Duet. I don't know how you say it in French. And um, and he was uh, he fought for the Pennsylvania Regiment and uh, lost both his arms oh, wow. in the Civil War at two different times which always was very alarming to me that they would send a one-armed man back into battle, but I guess they were desperate, so that's what they did. And uh, my famous story in my family was that my grandmother at that time, and I believe her name was Cornelia, uh, she had to fill out all the paperwork for his veterans' uh, pay, which, would, of course, since he had no arms, and um, they refused him. They said, you could still be a farmer even if you didn't have arms. So the family, like, organized them and gave them money or whatever, and they moved to New York, which is how my family ended up in New York. But uh, she reapplied for the veterans' benefits. And remember, it was before computers, so that was a pretty safe thing to do. And she put down that he was a haberdasher. And she said, now let me let them tell me he can make hats without arms, you know. So how much of that story is true and how much is legend, I don't know. But the That's facts, true. the basic facts, they moved to New York were true. Oh, wow. So now, growing up um, within your immediate family, did you have brothers and sisters? I have three brothers and a sister, and uh, so there are five of us. And um, I Where was. Where are you in the age? I'm order? the oldest. Okay. Yeah, I'm then my three brothers, and then my little sister. Um, but uh, we also lived in my grandmother's house quite a bit of the time, which was a very um, large house. And uh, my aunt and her daughter also were living there. Adrian and uh, my, cousin, my cousin Adrian and my aunt had just recently been divorced and so she moved back in with her mom 
and so we were all there in the house together. So it was kind of interesting. And why were you spending some time living with your grandmother? Well, my dad had come back from the war and had gotten a veteran's, whatever that is, a veteran. You, you could get a, a very uh, low-cost mortgage, but he had never, he didn't know my mom for several years after that. So he, and he gave my grandmother the mortgage with the intention that he would live there. And, you know, because there was, it wasn't quite really an apartment upstairs, but there was a third floor that had been finished out. So, um, you know, that was my dad's home and he contributed his, whatever the, whatever that is, the veterans benefit. Right, right. Um, and so when he got married, that's where they moved into that, um, upstairs apartment. And so then we, we lived there. And there was a couple of times when we had moved out. And then, don't, I don't know why we moved back. That's the question. I don't know. And so then for most of your time growing up, were you living with your grandmother in the house? I would say that half of the time I lived in the house with my grandmother. Half of my growing up. Tell me just a little bit about your, um, your uh, life with your siblings. Were you guys close? Did you play together? Uh, did you have similar interests, different interests? Um, I would say that we were pretty close, uh, but we didn't really have very, I mean, I, they were three boys, and I really didn't, I mean, they played stickball and did things. You know, sometimes we'd go on bike rides together, but we didn't really have a lot in common. You know, at home, we would be, you know, playful and kidding around and, you know, watch TV or whatever kids do together. And, you know, it was a pretty happy, happy growing up family. That's good. <laughs> um, let's see if there's anything else in the background. Um, were you uh, religious growing up? Uh, that's an, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yes, I was. And it was a, sort of a complicated part of my, my life because um, as in a lot of Irish history, there's a conflict between the Protestants and the Catholic. And so my dad is a Protestant and, and like I said, Scotch-Irish. And so, like Anglican-Irish, you know. And my mother is Irish-Irish. And so there was a lot of um, con and her family was Catholic. Yeah, okay, that's what I meant by Irish. Irish. Yeah. So yes, Catholic. And so um, my mom raised me Catholic, and you know, my dad had to swear an affidavit to do that, and um, to the Catholic Church, of course. And um, but it, it it was like weird because my family was very separated. Like my grandmothers and my aunt, and they they just thought Catholicism was, you know, a joke. And, and also it was of the lower classes, which, you know, they didn't approve of. And so um, there was this, I was like, a, I want to say I was almost like a little bit of a pawn. You know, like if, I, if my mom wasn't there on Sunday, then my grandmother would say, hey, you don't have to go to church. And so there was like, there was this kind of push-pull in, in the immediate family. So I think that's, uh, that was kind of complicated. But I was very religious growing up. I mean, I really took it seriously. And... Um, you know, felt like I had whatever people want to call, like, religious experiences, you know. So, um... Did that last through high school as well? No, it, it ended around just puberty. Um, that, because sex is a powerful draw. <laughs> and I'm saying, and I'm saying, what I can't do and right, what... <laughs> right, 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 wow. <laughs> so, were, were... Did you get a sense that you were the only one of your siblings that's felt this pull and push between the two sides of the family? Or yeah, I do. It, it was mainly you. I think it was main, mainly me, one, for one reason, because I was a girl, and uh, my, 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 my father's family was like a matriarch, so, and I was the girl, and so, and my cousin was there, and so we were the, like the three, or the four women of the, fa of the family, you know, and my mom was like the outsider, because she was a sister-in-law. So, yeah, and, and then also I think that my brothers just didn't pay as, as close of attention. They didn't really care. They were much more interested in, I don't know what, baby crockett hats and toy soldiers. And so talk to me just a little bit uh, about school in Brooklyn in the 50s. Um, was it fun? Did you enjoy it? Uh, do you have any vivid memories that, I, that, you, that jump out at you? I have many vivid memories that jump out at me. My childhood was, my, my schooling as a child was a little bit strange because as I mentioned, my mom wanted me to be go to Catholic school. And the Catholic school where my brothers were going to go, uh, they didn't have any room for me because I was already like in the second grade or something, you know, at any rate. There was no room in my class. So there was an offering of a school called the Nativity of Our Lord. And it was on Madison and Clawson, which is in the heart of Bed-Stuy. And I was living out further, um, like more towards Park Slope and um, Flatbush, out that way. 
But anyway, that's where I ended up going to school, and it was a very interesting school because, again, it was incredibly multiracial and diverse. And, uh, you know, it's typically 50s Catholic, like very strict sort of nuns and that sort of thing. But um, the people were amazing there. It was like, it was a very dangerous neighborhood. And so once we, it, this was a beautiful, beautiful old cathedral that had been built back when Bed-Stuy was like, like millionaires were living there and, and, and the school as well. Um, now, of course, it was a lot more run down, but um, when we would go in that school, they would take chains and lock up the gates and padlock them. And in the back where we had our uh, playground was just cement with like 20 foot high, which seemed even bigger then because I was little, uh, feet, um, foot high cyclone fencing with sheet metal attached to it so you couldn't see inside or, you know. So I definitely had the feeling that it was like dangerous out there, you know. But a lot of the kids in my neighborhood, I mean, a lot of the kids I went to school with were living there. And that was their normal place what to live. What grade was the school? Uh, it was one to eight. And um, one of my favorite, well, I have lots of favorite stories, but one of my favorite stories is that when my best friend, her name was Marie Alexander, and her mama, also Marie Alexander, and they were from Haiti. And uh, they had the, they, they just used to bring in double piano and play. They would both play, you know, two pianos for us a lot, and they spoke French, of course, and I just thought they were, you know, fabulous. And so sometimes after school, I would go to their house, and, you know, we were listening at that time to 45 records and drinking Coke when it was still in the little bottles, you know. <laughs> and um, But sometimes her mom would ask us to help her with stuff, you know, and she said, I want you to divide all these piles of herbs into four, you know, and then put them in these little cheesecloth things and or in some jars and then pour in oil in the jars and all this stuff. And I always noticed that Madame Alexander, as she was called, was very respected. I mean, men would tip their hat when she walked down the street and I was always realizing, you know, what's going on there, you know, and it turned out that she was a voodoo woman. And so that after school, I was making little voodoo packages. <laughs> Which I didn't really realize. <laughs> so I was real close to becoming a voodoo woman. <laughs> Did you maintain your friendship? No, not after high school. Unfortunately, it it kind of just dissolved. But yeah. So then, what, if that school went through eighth grade, where did you attend high school? Well, I attended high school at uh, Bishop McDonnell Memorial High School, which is on Easton Parkway in Brooklyn. I think it's now is a it's closed. It's a school for the deaf now, and it's just it, it's in walking distance of the botanical gardens and the library, and really a great great location. And um, it was a diocesan high school, which means you don't have to pay because Catholic school is not cheap. So if you're smart enough, then they give you a scholarship. And well, every kid at that school had a scholarship because they all came from different locations in the city or in Brooklyn anyway. So, um, and that's where I went to high school, except for the last year when um, I think Brooklyn was getting a little bit dicey. And uh, my dad decided that since my brother did not get into a diocesan high school, and the um, public school where he would have to go would um, have police people patrolling the hallways that didn't sit well with my dad, and so they moved us to Long Island, which was my senior year in high school, which was really traumatic for me. But it turned out, you know, everything turned out, oh, just okay. I mean, you know, it was fine. I made the transition and... Any any memories of that last year at a different school as the new person? Yeah, really. I, honestly, I was so I was so out of place. First of all, first day of school, I went with sandals because it was still it's September, so I'm still quite warm, and a skirt and a work shot, work shirt, one of those blue wool work shirts, you know, the hippie outfit, and no bra. Well, they sent me home. And what year was this? Oh God, that would have been sixty six. And uh, they sent me home because I didn't have a bra. So anyway, <laughs> it was a very different experience for me. <laughs> and then my the best friend that I made, a woman who I am still actually friends with, her name is Ronnie Silverberg. I mean, that was her maiden name. And I was sort of, you know, adrift a in the group. And she said, well, come with me and I will, um, I'll take care of you. You know, we'll, whatever. And so she wanted me to, which I would could never imagine having done in Brooklyn, pledge for a sorority because the high schools have sororities, you know. So anyway, it was the Jew she was Jewish, so I was the Jewish sor sorority, which was, I think, Delta, I don't remember even. Anyway, it was really weird to be the only Catholic girl in this Jewish s sorority, and uh, but I didn't take to it well, because, you know, they make you, they, the people, when you, when you pledge, no, no, I said, no, forget it, I'm out, I ain't doing that, you know, it's like, no, I've always been a little bit of a, of a rebel. <laughs> 
what were um, thinking back to when you were young, both you know in elementary school, high school. Do you have memories of of thinking about what you wanted to do when you grew up? Yeah, I did. I think and that. What, uh, what What was that? What are your memories of that? Well, I think part of it is I wanted to do. Th- something theatrical, you know, uh, and I think really that came out of my experience of going to the theater and seeing it and being amazed by it and then having my own theater, so to speak, in the basement. And um, so I think that was really in my heart that I wanted to do that, but I didn't realize that I that it could be a career. Um, I didn't think I it was a car- enough of a career. You know, for example, like my mom said, you know, well, how are you going to support yourself in that? So I think originally when I thought about it, I thought psychology would be a good, something good for me. And so I was interested in that, but um, I ended up um, having, being an anthropology major and studying um, religion and magic, which was sort of, in my own way, brought me back to theater and the uh, idea of what, what is theater and how it, the myths of, of the people or the community, how it creates community and how it finds places for people. Recently, we were, Del and I were working on a project at Walter Reed, just before it closed, and um, we were wanting to do work with veterans, and uh, we had uh, we even met with a, the man there, who was the head of it, Colonel Norvell, and so um, anyway, we were trying to the idea of using theater as a, as a way of healing, and um, it was very interesting to me because I think somehow that's how I sort of got to where I was in the first place. How how can theater heal? You know, what is its that, what is that property other than entertainment? It can educate and it can heal. And um, we learned a lot about the Greeks and um, in doing research, preparatory research. And what happened, basically all of them were soldiers. Even Sophocles was like a general. And uh, because they were in war for so long, everybody had experienced it deeply. And so a lot of the Greek plays are really about sort of trying to reincorporate the soldiers into civilian life, you know, in, of ways of you know, kind of trying to heal those those wounds of war. So that's one of the things that's always um, fascinated me about about theater. What do you do? You have any um, understanding of what prompted your parents' interest in theater that they started taking you? Well, actually, my dad didn't take me. It was just my mom, and I think it was her Irish heritage. You know, she was always very proud of Ireland and very proud of all the Irish writers, even though she didn't realize they were mostly Protestant. <laughs> it was okay with her because I am a big Beckett aficionado, and um, you know, um, she always would, oh, anything she'd hear about Beckett or see about Beckett, you know, she would send it to me, and I said he hated Ireland. He was a Protestant. He lived in France. You know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> why be bogged down in details? <laughs> That's funny. Are there any people from your childhood that you can think back on as being like really influential in either choices you made then that, or choices you made then that led to things later in your life? I don't know. No, I don't. I don't want to. You know, make certain family members maybe, like my aunt Fran. She was quite a character, and uh, she. Ins- I think she inspired me a little bit in the way that I am in the world. You know, the way I make jokes or the way I approach things or... Give us the little thumbnail view. Of she was aunt. a real character. Okay, she, if she had been alive, like, now, she'd have been, like, corporate CEO. No problem. But back then, you know, she was in her peak in, like, the 30s, late 30s, and dressed to the nines, like, with the, you know, the, everything that was just perfect in the 30s, you know. And I, I can see that movies in, in my mind, but I can't describe it. And um, she was married five times. Every time she got married, it was somebody richer, and she was a handful, to, to say the least. And she would tell stories, for example, like she she had a best friend, Elizabeth, and she only made friends with rich people. I don't mean to make her sound very shallow, but she was in a way, in that way. Um, and Elizabeth's father was like on the board of directors of uh, Standard Oil, and so they were best friends growing up. And she was my aunt Elizabeth my whole life, and so they were. They, and she had a lot of husbands too. And so they were driving. They were going to some. I think it was like the store club or something, Coca Cabana, something like that in New York. And her husband at the time, which was this funny story between them, like Elizabeth said, "No, no, no. I was married to Charlie. Then you had to be married to Arthur. No, that wasn't. Pe- no, no. Because I. So they would have these. Anyway, they're in, in the limo or wherever, and they stop because he doesn't have um, any clean socks because she didn't wash them. And then she tried to wash them out real quick and dry them in the oven, and they went on fire. 
So they stop, on, and they're, they're like in tuxedos, and they stop to buy him socks. And so, you know, it was just like, I don't know. <laughs> now, was she, you said she was your aunt. Was that your, on your mom's side? No, my dad's, dad's older dad. sister. Your dad. Okay. Yeah, and she, like, anyways, full of stories, total character, and not like where my mom was real religious, and you don't, you know, oh, yeah, that husband, whatever, you know. <laughs> so. Did you get to spend a lot of time with your aunt? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, a lot. And she was really the uh, instigator between me and my mom. You know, she was the one who really wanted me to, to be of a hu- upper upper class and to um, be Protestant, not not Catholic. And I mean, I you know why? I'm sure she was looking out for me in her own way, but I don't really understand all of that. And did you stay close to her as you grew older? I did. I did for a long time. That's yeah. nice. Yeah, it was. She was a special person. So you mentioned anthropology. Where did you enroll in college? I went to Nassau Community College. And then I went to SUNY New Paltz. And um, after SUNY New Paltz, I um, was living in Massachusetts, but I didn't get a degree, and I was living in Massachusetts. And, and I, what, t- what year was this, roughly? Uh, see, six, 71, something okay. like that. And um, What took you to Massachusetts? A man, a lover, you know. And so anyway, I was going to go and finish my degree there, but... Um, it didn't work out because um, I was just I was out of state student. And I didn't have enough money to be a, to pay for that, so I was sort of waiting around for another year to go by, and I was like auditing classes and stuff. And then um, my lover um, was hired by Emory University after he got his doctorate, so uh, that's how I sort of ended up here in Atlanta. And then we we only stayed together for really a few months after we got here. And, and so you arrived in Atlanta in what year? I you know I want to say it was probably seventy. Could have been 75, but I think it was 74. So talk to me a little bit after having spent all, most all of your life up to that point in New York City. How did you feel about moving to the South, to Atlanta specifically and to the South in general? Strange. Very strange. Like, I mean, I know this is just such a, a cliche, but I was at the grocery store, and I mean, maybe I'm here three days, and um, the ladies say, Oh, look, I never tried that. Is that good? And, oh, yeah, I use it all the time. I'm like, what is wrong with these people? Let's move. Come on, come on, the line. I'm waiting. And they're just having a pleasant conversation, you know. And, and then as summer rolled around, I realized that, um, you know why everybody talks so slow? Because it's so hot. You can't talk any. I mean, I, I was, my first house didn't have air conditioning. I had, like, ceiling fans. And I just... I suffered terribly. I, I'm not fond of the heat, even though I've been here uh, 30, so I don't know, 36, 7 years, whatever that. Never really adjusted to the heat. I prefer the cold. So when you first moved to Atlanta, what part of town were you living in? I was living in um, Decatur, but the other side of Decatur, like more towards Memorial. Yeah. The other thing I think that's funny about moving here is that, again, I mentioned to you how, how really, really blessed I feel, or I don't like that expression, sorry, how lucky I feel um, because of the diversity of New York. And um, when I came here, I, one of the first conversations I had with my mom is I said, Mom, it's really strange here. Everybody's either black or white, and they all been here for 200 years. And that was a real shock to me. I mean, like, where were the Italians? Where were the Puerto Ricans? Where, were, where was everybody? <laughs> so. Wow. And how do you, what's your sense of Atlanta now compared to then in terms of the diversity? Oh well, it's a, it's it, it, tremendously more diverse than it than it was, but it's still not integrated diver, diversity, if you know what I mean. Like, I know that, like for example, because I've worked in Albania with Albanian people, that there's large Albanian community, like in Lithonia or someplace, you know, and there's a an Israeli community in the north part of Alpharetta, and I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's like kind of strange, and and it, it's the same, um, I, you know. I, I had a young Dutch guy say to me one time that he couldn't believe it, the way that gay people were segregated. And he said, like, okay, if you're a man, then you're in Midtown. And I think he was actually a gay guy. I don't remember really. But anyway, and if you're a woman at that time, it was Little Five. The joke was, how do you know you're in Little Five? When you see women holding hands, that's Little Five. Um, and he was just shocked. He said, I just don't understand it. Like, all the, like in Holland or in Amsterdam, everyone would just live together. And you wouldn't, you have, wouldn't have to have, like, a little community over there for certain people, you know, and, and so that, that, was a, that was a definitely a surprise for me, because like I said, I, it was 
Greeks and then Mexicans and Germans and Portuguese and Dutch. You know, so it was just Mexican, Puerto Ricans, everybody. Now, growing up um, as a child in New York, did you travel? Did your family travel much, either around the U.S. or internationally? No, no. Uh, we we would travel to upstate New York primarily. That would be where we would go. Um, my aunt and grandmother had um, had a house in upstate New York, and um, we had a swimming pool, and it was really quite quite nice. And it was like about ninety six acres of land, like on the mountain, and uh, it was just fun. There were a few snakes around every now and then, but you know, other than that, and there was this wonderful place. It's it's, it's a place. It's the Schwangonk Mountains. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. It's obviously a Native American word, Schwangonk. Um, and there is a very very famous place there. Um, and mountain climbers come from all over the world to climb this rock face. And there was this bar. It was a restaurant bar called Emil's, and it was German. Emil was from Germany, and it was just like a German tavern. And everybody even had those like mugs with their names on them, you know, and stuff. And so um, I would just be, you know, my dad go with my dad and my uncle, and, and I'd have like a coke and pistachio nuts and play that like shuffleboard game and stuff. But being like just around the time of being interested in men, but not really all these gorgeous mountain climbers would come in and I'd just be like <laughs> just ogling them or whatever I don't know <laughs> but that's one of my memories of all these guys with the ropes and the sh you know they have these shorts and they're all very I don't know Swiss and German and muscular and handsome tan you know <laughs> wow well let's bring you back to the hot south so okay. you arrived here around 74 yeah, and you said you uh soon separated from your, your partner at the time. Uh, what did you do? Did you find a job immediately? Did you enroll in school? No, I, um, what I actually did was um, I worked in a very small, um, what do we want to call it, natural foods company. Um, I worked for a man named Nazar, and I know that's weird, but he only had one name. Um, and we made health food bars and trail mixes and all kinds of things like this. It was very alternative, very hippie. Um, How did you, did you just stumble upon that? Or did yeah, that interest I, you? Or? Well, you know, I've always been interested in food. It's one of my passions. I guess you would call me a foodie. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I met him through a friend of a friend. And he was looking for somebody. And then, and everyone who was working there was, I mean, there was only like five of us. And we were all very mellow, to say the least, you know. So, like one guy, whose name was Russell, and he changed his name to Raven, you know. <laughs> it was that time, and we were all very interested in Native Americans, and um, had studied with some Native American teachers, elders, and um, so that it was a sort of a common bond. And then we were all like, again, at that time, I was like Eddie Lee, who has a, had a theater here, Southern Theater Conspiracy. Um, to this day, he still makes fun of me. He said we would we went to dinner at Eat Your Vegetables, and I had like t uh, watercress with tofu, and he's like, "Do you still eat that?" You know. <laughs> Like no, not really. <laughs> it's a that is that restaurant. I do too. Oh, wow. <laughs> I eat good food, but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I guess my um, my food history is interesting as well. So, it's so did story. you? Um, how did you view yourself then in the early seventies? You said that was sort of alternative. Did you view yourself as a hippie? Mm -hmm. You did absolutely, totally. I wore feathers in my hair. Well, I was also part of the Native American thing, but yeah. I was definitely was a hippie. Talk to me a little bit about the, 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 how you're interested in the Native American angle started and, and sort of how you um, got into the, to the hippie movement or yeah. life or whatever and sort of how that interacted with your family given their sort of strict religious yeah. mm, background. It was my grandmother and aunt, and they were all fine with it, but my, my mom and dad were a little bit not so happy with it. But um, how it started, I think actually the Native American part is uh, past life. Something just inside of me was just drawn to it. Um, and um, over a period of time, I've had a lot of opportunity, or not a lot, very special opportunities to um, study with some Native teachers. And that had been a big influence on me. And I think I've always sensed, like you were asking me earlier, if I was a religious person. I don't think I was ever really religious. Maybe the better word would be spiritual. I always had a very strong sense that there was much more going on than than what we were sort of privy to without paying close attention. And I realized that uh, the Native American people had a consciousness that allowed them to experience 
those other sides of life. Not, not, not everyone, but some who decided to, to, to study that and to go that way. Um, and so I had tremendous respect for, um, for them. There was a, was the very first time I came here and Rolling Thunder, who was a very, had written a number of books and um, was very well known and respected, gave a lecture out at, um, oh God, Brock Eagle. And um, he's actually from like Colorado or someplace, but some group had brought him in to give a lecture. And where's Rock Eagle? It's um, it's just like uh, like by Lake Ocoee, okay. um, out I think that's I twenty out I twenty. Anyway, it's a it's a prehistoric rock mound that had been there. Nobody really knows how long it's been there, and it's a huge eagle, but you can only see it like if you were in an airplane or the top of a tree or something. And those stones don't come from there. They come from miles and miles and miles away. So it's, you know, it's one of those mysterious, interesting places. Anyway, so um, he was giving this lecture here, and he was quoting a, something where he said that people had asked him, how because he's a healer, and how do, do you work with herbs, and how do you, um, like, how do you know that? Did your people a million years, you know, a million years ago, a thousand years ago, like, test things, and then they would die, and they would know that that didn't work? And he was just, like, kind of chuckled and said, no, you just ask the plant, you know? <laughs> And just simple things of like respect. He said, if you take, you know, take plants, don't take them all. If you take some, always leave something, even if it's just a penny or a dime, something that you know, energy exchange with the earth. So it's a way of looking at the world that's, I think, very, very sophisticated. Although I think other people would tend to think of it as primitive. <laughs> so, if you can paint me just a, a brief overview of how Atlanta was then in the early 70s with the sort of hippie vibe still going on and the more alternative mm -hmm. aspects. Help paint the picture of Atlanta at that time. Well, I was, um, like I said, I've been in the area of either Emory or like Little Five Points and now Decatur. So that's that kind of mm -hmm. place that I know best. And fine. I hooked up with uh, Sevenanda, which was an, a natural foods store. And believe it or not, it was used to be over on Emory on Oxford. And it was this little narrow little store. I think it later became a Xerox shop or something. And then they moved, um, probably around 76 or 77, they moved to, to Little Five. And I had been working, not, not working, you know, you're a working volunteer there. And so um, I participated in that. And there were a lot of people who were, you know, alternative people, astrologers. I, I studied astrology for a lot of years and used to do charts. Um, and so I just fit in very well there and uh, then I started to work for the for Nazar and his house which is where his business was was a gorgeous old mansion on Lenox Road and you know before they demolished all of Lenox Road anyway and it was just like you go in this long driveway and his greenery and it was just gorgeous and anyway so again all hippie type people were there so it was just the extended you know and actually I think when I started to work in the theater which was about, let me see, 70, that must have been around 77. I was working at Open City Theater, and uh, I, there weren't so many hippies in the theater. There were people who had, like, gone to UGA and, and gotten their degree. So when did you finish or end your time working with him in the natural food company? Oh, it was kind of a crossover uh, because the theater didn't ever could pay enough to, to work, you know, to, to really work. And so... Um, I would always do that on this on the side when I worked for Open so, City. So it was Open City, the first theater you sort of officially worked for. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you came to them, and also a little bit about the organization? I've not heard of them. Um, they're most famous now because when the theater part of the theater closed, which is when I left, um, they kept some of them kept it going as a children's theater. So it was much more well known as uh, Open City Children's Theater. Um, and I do not remember the name. I can see his face as clear as day, but I can't remember his name, the guy who, who ran it. And a woman named Carol Adelstone um, and her partner, Ron, were running it when I worked there. And uh, it was in the first location of the theatrical outfit, which is actually how I met Dell. Because, um, and where was that? Um, St. Charles and Highland. Okay. If, you, if you just go down but past the storefronts, I think there's that jelly belly thing there or something. If you go down past those storefronts, there's an alleyway that runs behind the back. And um, there was a laundromat back there. And it was an old, it was abandoned building, oh, empty. And, uh, but it had been a laundromat, which meant that there, was, there were no posts. It was a clear open brick building with high ceilings, which is very appealing. 
and uh, and so that they started that theater there. And I, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't even know who introduced me to them or how I started working there. But I started working there mo mostly in tech. And, and they had been open for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I guess I worked there maybe, say, a year and a half, two years, something like that, and then they closed. But the last production that they did, I was working as the assistant director. Um, and this guy comes in, also known as Dell, and uh, he has, like, literally, like, measuring tapes and stuff, And because he is the new theater. He's, the theatrical outfit is going to move in there, because he started the theatrical outfit. And he had some of his, he had been a professor, and had some of his students and then some just professional artists that joined up and they started a company called Theatrical Outfit which was a closed ensemble which consisted of musicians, dancers and actors and they made all their own work. They worked also worked a lot in prisons. But anyway, I was in there in the rehearsal and I just said, excuse me, the fuck out of here because well, you know, we're in the middle of rehearsal, you know, this is ridiculous, you can't come in. And well, he, oh, okay, okay, I didn't know you were blah, blah, blah. But there was something about him, I don't know what it was, but I thought, I don't know, you know there's something in the back of my, my mind that I, I was attracted to him, or I, I don't know, maybe it was I recognized him from a past life, who knows. But I was living with an actor, a man named Bob, and um, he became in a relationship with Celeste Miller, who started her own company, and is a very well-known dancer around town. Um, and now she has a, she's a professor in Brunel, I think, in Iowa. Anyway, um, so they were a couple, and I was a couple, so I didn't, you know. And then after Bob and I weren't together anymore, I just kept thinking, God, I want to get involved in the outfit. You know, I missed the theater then. I wanted to go back, and it was a closed ensemble, so there really wasn't any way for me to get in. So I decided I would invite Dell to dinner. I was seeing a show, I think it was Exit the King, and um, I was just talking outside. Um, we were saying, you know, it's strange. We both travel in the theater world, but we don't really know each other. And we don't, we don't, it's a different circle that we're in. And it would be interesting to know more about what you're doing. And so come to the house for dinner. And um, he did. Then he came in. And he was very nice, relaxed, you know, whatever. And then he's like, he said, so uh, where's Bob? And I said, oh, Bob doesn't live here anymore. And he went, oh. This is the date. I mean, he didn't say that, but he went, oh. <laughs> I think he was looking forward to just, a, you know, whatever. Anyway, but we tended, we seemed to hit it off, so I guess that was okay. <laughs> so then how long from roughly that time until you started officially dating? Oh, the next day. <laughs> he called me for breakfast. <laughs> oh, how funny. So that would have been what year? 78. And you've been together ever since? Mm -hmm. Fall of 78, yeah. And then that's when we had the idea for Seven Stages, which is also interesting because everyone always says, how old is Seven Stages? And Well, we opened the first production on October 5th, 1979, but we were incorporated in May, and we started looking for the space in the fall and started renovating the space. So, you know, I call it the pregnancy year, you know, sort of the year before everything's going on, but you don't really see anything yet. So to talk to me just a little bit about that whole process. Once you got together with Dell, given that he was with Theatrical Outfit, how did, it, how did the issue come up? How did you guys say, oh, let's create something ourselves versus uh, you joining Theatrical uh, Outfit? Right. Well, that's part of their history. What happened is that they all lived in a big mansion on Low Water, and they would go to rehearsals in the morning, or maybe it was the other way around. They would all do, like, press work and graphics and all that. It was like four hours and then they, the rest of the day they would be in rehearsal and developing work and um, and after two years it exploded. I mean they lived in the same house and worked together so it was like 24-7. Very, you know, um, individual people, strong wills, you know. And so everybody said, I want out of here. You know, Elise Swit, who's, who's a member of the company, um, is a vocalist. My God, she's amazing. And she said, I'm just going to do music. I'm, I'm sick of theater, you know. And she still doesn't go to theater. Um, and other people went off and did different things. And, and David Head and another woman, I can't remember her name. That would be terrible, but I can't remember her name. Anyway, they decided, they were like the last ones in the room. And they went, oh, okay, so I guess we're a theatrical outfit now because everybody wanted to do something else. And that was right around the time that, that I had met Dale. So then, did he leave the mm -hmm. outfit mm -hmm. at that time? Yeah. Um, and so you decided that you two wanted to create a theater. How did, as you started having your initial discussions together about that, what were some of the things that you wanted your theater to be? Or, or, or talk me through a little bit of that whole 
when you're trying to put your ideas together and decide, okay, what is it we're creating? Right. Um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question because I think what we wanted to do is to create a, a theater that wasn't already in Atlanta. You know, um, so we had a new idea to do something, and, and I'm sure I'm influenced by New York um, by seeing different kinds of, of work, not all just reality plays and plays that are, you know, the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd. I mean, that's great. But, again, like I said, maybe I'm a serious person, but I just feel like that, that theater had something else to offer, more to offer than just entertainment. And um, and he he was unbelievable. He felt that way, too. I mean, it, it wasn't my influence on him. I mean, he was already knowing that. And... Um, so we decided, well, what did we want to do? And we, we wanted to do with a, a theater, I guess you want to do a theater that's like social, socially active theater uh, to discuss ideas of, of rape and uh, transgender and HIV and, you know, all the things that people didn't normally necessarily think of as, um, you know, as, as what they would expect at the, at the theater. Um, at the time in Little Five, we, we drove around a lot of different neighborhoods, and we almost landed in Virginia Highlands, but it was so run down that um, we decided to go for Little Five instead. Well, well, where was it in Virginia Highlands? Uh, we, right there on um, whatever it is, uh, North Island in Virginia, right in there. All those, all those were like boarded up, big broken windows and things like that, and later... Met, Several years later, a very wealthy developer, he and his wife from San Francisco, came and basically bought the whole block and, you know, waved a magic wand, and that's how Virginia Highlands became Virginia Highlands. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but we, um, ended, we ended up in Little Five in um, this other theater, Southern Theater Conspiracy, uh, which is, Eddie Lee was the director of that, and uh, opened down the street, um, like, in the summer, and we opened in the fall. So that was... Um, it was really exciting. We we did a lot together. Uh, the first show that he he did, um, the Mandrake, and so Dell and I were both in that, and that was great fun. And then we the following Christmas we did a Christmas Carol, where we did the first act at Seven Stages and the second act at at, at uh, the Southern Theater Conspiracy, and it was fun. The, the premise Dell played Scrooge, and the premise was that the at the office party somebody had spiked the punch with acid, so um, that's sort of where we got our. <laughs> stuff you know was it a hit yeah it was huge and then when we walked from the theater to the other theater uh, you know some people would stop at the bar you know it was right there and and people would be singing christmas carols and and this is a this is a, a story about the coffin at the end um and um we eddie would always at the end of the theater we want to sincerely thank the alliance theater for renting to us on a weekly rent this lovely pine box coffin that we have that they've so generously rented to us, you know, and everybody would go, boo. <laughs> so where was the, the Southern Theater Conspiracy? Um, you know, uh, do you know where the sushi restaurant is now? It's right, it was right there. It had three storefronts. And the back part of the restaurant, that was their stage. Okay. And to talk to me uh, so that people know when they're hearing this, um, your first building there in the Little Five Points, how you chose it, what it had been previously, et cetera. Yeah, well, uh, previously, before we got there, it, it had been um, abandoned, uh, broken front glass windows and, you know, things like that. And um, I think prior to that, it had been a, um, an artist studio, someone like living in the abandoned space. And then I'd heard before that it was also a... Um, a motorcycle repair shop. And where was this? Uh, it was a 430 Moreland Avenue, which is directly, it's like where Psycho Sisters is. Okay. That's it. Okay. So, and as a matter of fact, when we left, they retired the number. There is no 430 Moreland Avenue. I, and I, when did Seven Stages then move over to you? 87. 87. 87. We took the lease in January and then moved in in July. Good. Well, we'll, get, we'll get back to yeah. that because that, that's when I think of Seven Stages, that's where I know. Of the, the movie theater. The, yeah. 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 You should, the other one was great, though, because uh, one of the best things about it was that it was so small. The stage was so because it was just a storefront, right? And so we had big windows in the front, and so we used the sidewalk. And we would have video cameras out there and microphones and lights, and we would have people, like, pull up. Like, one of the guys who worked with us, an actor, had this big old Cadillac. And so in one of the shows that Del wrote, he'd pull up on the sidewalk, and the cast just got out and got in the Cadillac and drove away. You know, so we incorporated the street so that it was um, a more expanding the uh -huh. stage. Uh -huh. 
Interesting. So I'm assuming by the time you create the theater with Dell, you sort of realize, okay, this is going to be a career. This is a life choice. Yeah. When did, you, when did that initially hit you that, okay, I'm, I'm, this is going to be my path in life? You know, I'm going to say I was a little slow. I mean, I, I think that it was um, because for the first five years as we were running the theater, we were still having to do part-time jobs in order to survive. And um, it wasn't until we hired the third person who said, I'm not going to work for free, that we went, oh, okay, I guess we'll pay, pay, pay us then, you know. So we did these ridiculous hippie ideas about what you needed and how much you're, uh, so. Um, <laughs> money's just, you know, a difficult subject sometimes. Right, right. Um, at any rate, um, I'm sorry, I forgot. What, no, I was just saying, when did it, when did oh, it, when did it actually occur that, oh, to me? This is going to be my right. I think it was around the fifth year because that's when I actually started to get a paycheck. And it wasn't that. It was like, okay, now my focus is really, you know, here. It's not anywhere else. It's here. And um, so that was, I guess, it. But it never, it, I never, there wasn't like a moment, you know, so much as that. I sort of just jumped on the train and the train kept going. And, and during that time, how, what was the interaction like with your family? Were they supportive? Were they constantly going, when are you going to get a real job? Or? I would say they were just, I would say they were more removed. Um, you know, they were all still in New York. Um, I don't know if my sister had moved to Connecticut by then, but, you know, and it was so far away. And I didn't have a lot of um, money, and so I didn't fly there very often. And um, you know, so I, you know, we had like birthday phone calls, and but it was they weren't particularly involved. And my mother was just thrilled about the theater, except that you know she wished it was a more money making thing. But she, you know, not always blame her. She, I, you know, she would say, "I don't understand why you you, you don't make enough." And I said, "Well, it's your fault. <laughs> you hadn't turned me on to the theater." <laughs> So then, I, I talk to me a little bit about d during this time how your feelings, if they did change, about Atlanta, how how that happened. Because when you first arrived, it was very different from what you had right. experienced growing yeah. up. And as you're starting to build a life here and, and open your theater, did you do you have memories of how your 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 feelings vis-a-vis -vis the city itself started to evolve? Well, I, I was very fond of the city of Atlanta at that time. Um, it was, a, was Maynard Jackson was mayor, and it was a very affluent time for the arts here. Uh, I think that probably um, for the arts, he's been the most dynamic person that we've ever had. Um, I think Shirley Franklin was like a, worked as a, some sort of office person there at the Bureau of Cultural Affairs, and he turned uh, it, it into a department in the city, um, so it had more budget and it had a bigger staff. and. Um, there was a seat of money you could get, and for teaching and different things, and there were just there was just actually more money for the arts. They didn't feel like they do now that everything is you know you can't spend, you can't spend, you know. And um, so we used to say all the time that Atlanta is just right on the verge of of blooming. And if you ask me that, I would say the same thing today. But it has never quite bloomed, in my opinion. You know, it's. You know, they have the you know you have your rich institutions that are supported by, you know, the rich corporations and everything that wants to stay status quo, and then you have young people who come in and are really trying to do dynamic stuff, and it's so hard for them to, to continue, you know, because there's so so little funding. And as an individual actor, the same is true because most of the organizations don't have enough money to pay what you would consider a real salary, so. Um, you know, a lot of actors go away. They go to New York or Chicago or L.A., wherever, to, to try to get work. So there's a huge um, drain of talent here. You know, people end up, because you know, Atlanta isn't kind to its artists. They don't support them, you know, and so it's difficult. How did, at the first few years of Seven Stages existence, um, can you talk a little bit about the support or lack of support from other theaters within the community? Was there a sense of camaraderie? Did people know quite how to take you as a theater, or did you get yeah. any sense of that? Well, but like I said, we have a very close and ongoing um, relationship with the Southern Theater Conspiracy, and specifically Eddie Lee, um, and who moved to Seattle, of course. And um, But there weren't really any other theaters. There was, I guess, the Academy and uh, the Alliance, mm -hmm. and um, I liked Frank Wittow a lot. I took some acting classes with him. 
Um, but I was never one of the academy people, and and there there wasn't any. It was no dad's garage, no horizon. They, they just they weren't born yet. So um, it was a very small community in that. And way. can you um, just for benefit of the interview, um, tell me the background to the name Seven Stages and how you and Dell decided to pick that as the name of your theater? I would be happy to do that. Um, I because uh, again. Um, back to my own spiritual pursuits, but I'm interested in um, Taoism. Again, it's, an, it's a nature thing. It's back beyond, you know, be, before um, the, mo the monolith of the patriarchal god. Anyway, um, the, it comes from the, uh, the book called the I Ching, which I don't, if you, if you know the I Ching, it, or I'm probably not saying it in the Chinese way. Um, and it's a, it's a book of divination. It's a uh, quite thick. Uh, it has a, um, you can do it either with the arrow sticks or with coins. And you basically, uh, we threw the coins, my friend Raven and I, we threw the coins and um, it, it came up 64. So you go to the hexagram, which is 64, and it was uh, Fu, the turning point. Uh, the turning point was the most significant um, hexagram in in the I Ching because it's at the middle point and often the middle, like the center is, is stronger than the edges if, if you sort of follow my drift on that. Um, and uh, turning point is about bringing light into the darkness is basically what it said. And uh, there's energy like there's rumbling under mountains and there's lots of energy that's there for that. Uh, and it also talks about the, the fact that it takes, um, that a man goes through seven phases of a man or a woman, I should say, sorry, goes through seven phases or seven experiences of life. For example, if you, if you think about the chakra, there are seven chakras, and each one is different. You know, this is, um, this is like your heart chakra, so this is where a lot of love and compassion and energy comes out. But if you're in your root chakra, you, you're either more likely to be having sexual feelings or feelings of violence. So we, were, we thought that was really kind of cool because it encompassed the entire experience of human nature you know, from the highest to the lowest and everything in between. And um, we thought that was a really cool uh, idea that theater would be encompassing everything. And also that the idea of bringing light into the darkness was really, for us, one of the most um, important kind of ideas. And um, we, we've done um, so many plays that, you know, I could talk about this, but the one one I will mention is that, uh, maybe there were two actually, one was, uh, this play that I played, Elsa Tabori, was a George Tabori play and about his mother and how she escaped from Auschwitz while he was in London studying. And, um, and what was the title? My, My Mother's Courage. And when did you do this? Oh, that would have been like late 90s. And, uh, and it was this com one scene that we had a German director, and there was one scene, and she had actually worked with Tabori, which was interesting. Her name is Veronica Noveg, and, uh, you know, Tabori left America. He was very upset with um, America because of the, uh, he was writing for Hitchcock in L.A., and it was around the time of the McCarthy stuff, and he just said, I'm out of here. You guys are crazy. I just went through this Nazi stuff, and I'm not going to do this, and left. And he refused to have any of his work produced. In, um, in America forever. And so it was his birthday, and he was giving everyone gifts. And she had been in the company, and she said, I would like to do one of your plays at Seven Stages in Atlanta. And he said yes. So we were the first people to do a Tabori play for you know a num quite a number of years in the States. Anyway, um, so there's this really scary car, uh, this cattle car scene, and we just, because you know how the Germans are, um, anyway, it was just straight scaffolding, straight up with no barrier, no, and we were all just like huddled in the middle, so I'm not so in the middle, and like holding on to each other like this and shaking, and so the, the scaffolding was going like that, and uh, this one young man, African-American man, after, after the show, he was in high school, and he, he said that he, he really never knew that anyone else had been persecuted like that that what had happened to the Jews, he thought it was only Africans and the Middle Passage and, and all the stuff that he knew about. But he said, you know, that the, that scene on the, on the car, in the cattle car, reminded of him of what it must have been like to be in the ship, in the holes of the ship. And, and so to me, that was light in the darkness. You know, like, yes, you're not the only one who's persecuted. And the other time, my other favorite time, was, uh, I don't know if you know Turner Schofield. Um, he's an Emory graduate, and he's a transgender person. And... Um, 
he, he was doing his show, 127 Easy Steps to Becoming a Man, which is a fantastic show. And um, there was a, a guy who was there who had come with someone else who was a devout Christian. And apparently really was moved by the performance and went back to his Christian club, which I think he was actually here at Georgia State, and made this pronouncement about how we have got to start seeing people as individuals and not as like a group that we're just going to redline. And so Turner touched him in such a way that he, it opened his mind. It let light into the darkness. Right. So that's my, that's like. My private personal mission, maybe, I don't know, but that's the part that makes me so excited, and it's happened over and over and over and over. How did, how did Atlanta react to a theater of your type when it first started at that time, given that there weren't as many other smaller theaters mm -hmm. around and that the larger theaters at the time probably were doing more mainstream type yeah, work. I think we were very fortunate because we had uh, th that area, that community is so dynamic, maybe not so much anymore because it's a little bit more gentrified. But I mean, even the people who were living in Inman Park, I mean, those you could have bought those houses for $20,000. You know, they were in disrepair, but so they weren't all rich people. And um, a lot of people were artists. A lot, like I said, there's this one painter who, the guy who lived at Seven Stages be when it was abandoned. Um, you know, he, they just, they moved to, you know, down the street, two streets down. And, and so a lot of it, it was a very um, heavily artist populated area. And um, we just had lots and lots of attendance, but it was local attendance, you know, like really people from Little Five. And, you know, we went through many years later, we went through sort of a crisis of audience because all those folks like kind of got real jobs and had babies and weren't going to the theater so much anymore so we kind of had a little bit of a drop off of so we're trying to find new audiences and things like that so um but I mean I felt like we were really well appreciated the community was thriving with music and dance and there were lots of galleries in Little Five, Pin five Points believe it or not so when when did you decide as an organization that you needed to move from your original space on Moreland? Well, it's like so many things with Seven Sages is um, going with the flow, so to speak. Um, we were just chucking along, being perfectly happy, um, loving our space, um, you know, um, and all of a sudden, the, the um, what, was, what was it called? Dancers Collective which is where Seven Stages is now, that movie theater. A woman named Joanne McGee, who had been a dancer in Atlanta. I mean, she was my elder, so she's been a dancer, was a dancer forever. I think she worked with the original ACDC company here, if you know that history. Um, and anyway, she had a small inheritance. Her husband was a very successful lawyer, uh, and uh, she took that building and renovated it. And it was, I mean, there, we have photographs of of it, I think maybe you have some of them as well, but it was just, I mean, there were holes in the roof and they were storing like toxic chemicals in oil drums and it was all boarded up and it paint, a paint on there that said Faith Cathedral. And when she took it over? Mm -hmm. okay. And she renovated it and to whatever level it was and then um, it was impossible for her to, her husband said, I'm not, I'm not paying all the bills anymore. You know, I can't just write all of it, you know. So anyway, they, she gave it up and it was like kind of floundering and um, we just said, well, let's us do it. Let's go. let's go. There's an opportunity, and our space is so small, and okay. I was more afraid than Dell, I have to say. And when was that building built? Do you know? Was it from the 20s, the 30s? Either the 30s or the 40s. But I know that it was a viable, uh, the, the two theaters, the, the Variety Playhouse and us, we were like the movie district. I mean, apparently, the, having two movie theaters next to each other was a big deal, and a lot of people would go there. So it was originally a, a film theater. Did you ever find old things in the building? Or you know, the, the building history? had been so run down and so um, dilapidated, but the original uh, projection room was our original offices. And um, and you went up these stairs, and then there was this huge projection room, and but it had those little, like, like cement this thick, but windows. Because where that would stick the things through, right? And the door was amazing. The door, I could never move. I mean, we never closed it. It was, like, made of solid steel, and it was, like, this thick, and it had, like, these 
you know, ge gears on it that you would close. And I was like, oh my God, I hate to get trapped in here, you know. And that, that's why they were doing it, because of the fire risks. Right, right, right. Anyway, that was our office. So we had four desks, like, crammed in. And I was laughed because at the, if we had a matinee or something for kids, you had to unplug the phones. You had to put blind, you know, curtains up over the blinds. And you go, so... <laughs> How was the building in terms of repair when you took it over from the dance collective? Was it, did you have to do a lot of work? Well, we were fine there for a little bit of time, but it was the walls because it was an art deco. Oh, it was built in, it was an art deco design, so maybe that gives us a clue as to when it was built too. Um, and it had these um, pink walls with big bubbles that floated up the side. It was very beautiful. And she paid a fortune to have it, it was the original, she paid a fortune to have it restored. And she cried because we painted it all black. But, you know, you got to have black in a theater. It's not like dance. So did you much. take pictures? <laughs> Hopefully you took pictures. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, and, you know, so that was the for one of the first parts of the renovation. And then we needed a, we, we had no dressing rooms, you know, so we were using the basement, which was just awful, very damp, musty. And um, so we, we decided we would build a, you know, the, the dressing rooms. We built the walls, and then that, when we wanted a smaller space, so then that became the smaller space, so we ended up with, with the two theaters. and um, So we've done a lot of renovation. The first renovation we did, I was really disappointed because it was all inside the walls. You know, we upgeared all the electricities and all the, you know, whatever. And that was like, we spent all that money and we don't have anything for it, you know. <laughs> but then we've had, you know, subsequent renovations. I guess the biggest renovation was right before the Olympics. Talk to, talk to me about that. Uh, well, we, we put in a new lobby and we remodeled the lobby, I guess is the way. New, new front doors. We added a box office. Um, the florist shop that had been there had long gone out of business. And so um, we, put a, uh, we put a second story on that, which is where our offices now are. And underneath it became a rental property, which is called Java Lords now. Had several incarnations, but it's Java Lords now. And... Um, and we put in lots and lots of sound equipment and, light, again, more lighting equipment. And we re refinished all the floors. We're very fortunate because we have a, because Joanne was a dancer that she put in at that time, again, which would have been this, somewhere in the 70s, a uh, $30,000 sprung oak floor, which is like people go, sprung oak. Anyway, you have to be in the, I guess, in the business to appreciate that. It's very hard on your knees otherwise. <laughs> So when did you um, carve off and, and create the back theater? Like, oh, that was then. That was it before the... Um, right before the Olympics? No, actually, that would have been sooner. That would have been more like um, probably 89 or 90 okay. when we put the back theater okay. in. Did, when you moved from Moreland Avenue to Euclid, just being in a, a different physical space, talk to me about how, if at all, that influenced the theater, your work, your thoughts just did, did being in a different space bring any changes to what you did well the physical the physical space itself is um is so different you know that we when we did um uh, mother's courage um we uh, the woman literally she had a wagon of course and she would pick it up like this and go two feet and go okay now i'm in poland and you know the audience completely was okay with that but you know you move two feet and you're in poland it's you know, so just expansion in terms of design, what was possible with design, and the height. I mean, we had very high ceilings, of course, in the other space as well, but, we, you know, we maintained that height. And we also, uh, the audiences also were, were the same. They were like the Greek or original style, you know, with the seats going up like that, which was in the old space, which was also dictated by that space. And then um, we decide we, that's, we don't like the proscenium arch very much anyway, so, you know. Um, but I really want to say that in terms of the space itself, I know for me as a designer, the first time I, I did a major design that toured, I, I was like, I, you go like, really? What was I thinking? Because the floor at Seven Stages is an enormous part of the design. It's what you see when you look at the floor, you know. So I would, I would use, I mean, I would use the fact that people were looking this way. And the design, and the show toured, it was a fantastic show composing blind Tom Wiggins, which I have to tell you about later. Um, and uh, the, the stuff that I had out had designed for the floor and for the, what you, and so people are sitting up like this, and I'm going, you can't see the piano. You can't see the, and I was like, ah. <laughs> anyway. 
just like you know, uh, learning experience along the way. So tell me a little bit about that show. When was that? Oh, Blind Tom. Okay, uh, that I don't remember exactly what time. I'm going to say it was in the 90s, maybe late 90s, and um, it was written by a man named Robert Earl Price, who is a playwright in residence with us and has been for forever probably since like 87. As a matter of fact, we're working, we've worked on several scripts together and we're working on another one now. Um, but this was a discovery actually that Dell made of um, a man named Blind Tom, Tom Wiggins, and he was born a slave in Georgia, in Columbus, Georgia. And he was autistic and blind and could hardly walk. And um, the master, um, who was the editor of the local newspaper and also one of the like leading Confederacy separatist persons, was uh, Tom's owner and wanted to throw him to the pigs, which was a common practice uh, because, you know, that child had no value. And uh, so his mother, Charity, begged him, and she was an inside working slave, and uh, she begged him, please, I'll find something that he can do. I'll find something. And this is a true story, of course, right? So at, um, at, at some point, his daughter is getting, the, the master's daughter is getting piano lessons, and Blind Tom sits down at the piano and plays exactly what he had pe played. So his autism was such that he could play anything that he heard perfectly. All he had to hear it was one time. He performed all over Europe. He performed for Queen Victoria. He was uh, he played a list piece. is the famous story about him. And the, the guy was trying to mess with him, so he played the note wrong. Tom played it right back, the same wrong note. Um, anyway, he was earning, I want to say it was 100000 or maybe $200,000 in gold a year for the Confederacy. Nice, huh? And uh, he, by he was nine years old, he played at the White House. And, but he'd stayed a slave his whole, his whole life, and no one ever even knew about him. He's buried in a pauper's grave in Brooklyn. And uh, another interesting part about Blind Tom was that when, uh, he, when slavery finally was abolished, he, was, he became property he stayed property because he was still like, um, he couldn't take care of himself. So he had, a, had to have a guardian. His mother wanted to be his guardian, but they didn't let her. They, the daughter of the master um, maintained his guardianship. And uh, so they actually teach him in, at Emory Law School. They teach that as a you know, property thing. So it, it was very interesting. And then um, this man, John Davis, who was a, a guy from Brooklyn, nice man, really great musician, and um, always had to play classical music. So he, he and his brother played jazz on the side to be rebellious, you know. But he just discovered this guy. He discovered his sheet music or something and, and, and did it all and gave us the completely, you know, n no infringement, you know, it's yours. Make something of it, you know, do it. Let people know. And it was an amazing, amazing production. And I think the thing that was so incredible about it is the ni opening night, his descendants came. Like this elderly woman who had been, you know, his great-great-granddaughter or someone, and a, a young woman who was a lawyer at Alston and Bird, and they were all descendants of Blind Dong and his family, you know. So it was like, oh, my God. You know, it's that sort of looking at history and, and, and seeing it, right? And no one even knew he existed. It was like a discovery. Was it a successful It was very, show for you? very successful for us, yes. Okay. Very successful. And you know, deals with some hard subjects, you know, obviously the the general and you know, the daughter who also was in a, her own cage, but it was of course a velvet cage, you know, it wasn't quite you know, she couldn't you know, she couldn't have anything, she couldn't anyway. So that was that. How how did you see your audiences at seven stages evolve? from the late 70s up through, you know, the last few years. Have they changed? Yeah. Have they stayed the no, same they in have, terms? No, they certainly have changed, absolutely. I think that uh, we, we're very, very lucky. We, um, I think that our audience has been, uh, maybe not in the very, very beginning, but pretty much through the main part of our existence, been a very um, diverse audience. We've had um, a lot of older and young people, which is rare, and um, we also have, have a lot of African American people who come, and Hispanic people who come. I have a friend who, Mary Brecht, who came from um, New York to, to do design work with Joe Chaik, and, and she was just, her mouth was open. She said, I go to theater all the time in New York, I never see so many black and white people together. So, I mean, that I think is a, is a good thing, you know? Um, but I think it's also about reflecting people's situation, you know, reflecting life, like what is life on the stage. So if, if there's something there that rings true with you, then um, you, 
you, you identify with that, you, you want to participate in it. Um, we were uh, marched against by the Ku Klux Klan, and um, that was a, a you know sort of very significant moment. I think and that was history. a response to what? Talk about what they were protesting. There was a, a, a woman, uh, an African American woman, her name is June Jordan. Unfortunately, she has passed away now. Um, and she was a, a, a real uh, incredible writer and a social activist. And she was writing, she wrote lots of books like exposing things about Nicaragua and El Salvador and, and all those kinds of things. And in her early career, she was a speech writer for Malcolm X. And she had, she taught at Berkeley and Stony Brook and all these places because she was mostly a professor and a writer and she and her girlfriend had written this musical uh, called Bang Bang Ugarales and it was about the rise of the Klan in um, in the Northeast because she was also from Brooklyn. Anyway, um, she said people don't think about the Klan being in Brooklyn or Connecticut but they are everywhere and maybe they don't call themselves the Klan, maybe they call themselves whatever, the not native sons or something but that's who they are, you know violent and racist and um, so anyway we were doing this play and, in, in, and this was in the old space and uh, there was advertising because that, that back then you know they would even do little trailers on TV for your shows and things it's hard to imagine but they did and um, so we kept saying this is an anti-clan play an anti-clan play this is a you know and uh, the story of the play was kind of interesting in the sense that the artists got together to put on a, like a variety show for uh, to raise money for to create awareness, and um, so we were there. And what happens is the janitor of the school, his father is like the head clan guy, so he's telling the father the whole time what we're doing. And so finally, the show ends with the clan surrounding them with fire, like they're going to burn down the school. And uh, so basically, we were having rehearsals, and then we started getting threatening phone calls. From what the year was this roughly? I want to say this was 86, it was 86, June of 86, and uh, we were getting threatening phone calls, and um, they were saying that, that, that they had seen Dell on TV in a, in a tuxedo, and they were saying, we're going to kill the guy in the tuxedo, and the GBI, and everybody kept saying, oh, don't worry, the Klan, you know, if, if we was Marietta, we'd be scared, but, you know, this is a black power system, they haven't marched inside the city of Atlanta in 20 years, they're never going to show up at your theater, don't worry. Lo and behold, there they were. Uh, they pulled up in the parking lot where the liquor store is, next to where like eat your vegetables used to be. And I don't know how many of them there were. It wasn't like a hundred or anything, but it was maybe like fifteen or twenty. And some were in military paraphernalia, and some were in their white hoods. And I stood, I stood at the top with my friend June, and we were holding hands, and both of our hands were literally shaking. And I had a, another friend of mine who was an actress, Cece, and she had, she'd been an actress at La Mama in New York, and. She lived at our house because we had a big house over on Elmira. Anyway, she came, she came running over, and she had, like, on her slippers, and she just, like, put her coat on and ran. She said, there's no way the Klan is marching on my theater, and I'm going to be at home, you know? <laughs> so anyway, even though that was um, it was really frightening, and uh, it, it got crazy, and the police were, I mean, they just surrounded them like a wagon train and forced them to go away. Um, and we were, like, also, woohoo, you know, and then the, FBI, GBI, whoever police were there were saying, now don't get so excited because, you know, their MO would be that they'll come back and firebomb you at like 3 in the morning. And so there was this group called the Anti-Clan Watch, and they were based out of, I think it's Clark, it was someplace at Atlanta University, and uh, they took shifts, and this is before cell phones, they took shifts and stood in front of our theater, like for three hours, like between like say 1 and 4, and then another one came back at 4, to protect the theater. And was, was this throughout the whole run? Or how no, no, run? it was just like about for the first few days or maybe the first week, you know, something that it kind of, we just figured it was okay. But I just couldn't, I still can't believe that to this day, that these people would do that. I mean, I mean, that's sort of what they did. And they were very upset because there was some grand dragon from California in the group because they, they would monitor the groups, you know, they would take photos and know who was who and where they were going. And Anti-Clan Network is what it's called. So, so was the play a success? Oh, yes. Yeah. It was a very, very successful play. As a matter of fact, for opening night, um, oh, shoot, I'm going to go blank on the name. The guy who defended the Chicago 7, Kunstler, came, uh, the attorney Kunstler, and, um, God, I can't, Susan, Susan Green, who was the editor of Essence Magazine at the time, and um, 
the most famous African American woman in the world, Angela Davis. I mean, these are people who were all coming. We got a telegram from Ntisaki Shange, who couldn't make it. You know, but it was very because um, that's because of June's status. June Jordan and her status was. I mean, she was friends with all those people. As a matter of fact, I called her house one time when she was living on Long Island, and I spoke to this very drunk woman, and she was delightful, but you could tell she was tipsy. And so I got on the phone with June, and, and June said, do you know who you were just talking to? I said, no. And um, it was the, um, God, I'm so bad with names now. Ah, the woman who wrote the uh, Color Purple? Alice Walker. Alice Walker, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, and the film had just come out, and she was really unhappy. And so her and June were drinking wine and kvetching about the movie. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I said, oh, I was just talking to Alice Walker. Wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Little brushes with celebrities. I think that's the one thing that, of all the things in the theater, uh, I mean, of all the ex learning experiences, in the, it's the people, like everything else. It's an amazing people. I mean, I could do a two-hour inter interview just on Joe Chaikin alone. I mean, the seminal influence of alternative theater in America or the world, and he worked with us for 15 years. I mean, am I lucky or what, you know? Wow. What? There's so much to, you've got me off on so many directions. Sorry. That I'm sure, no, it's good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Of, of, of the topics, of the, of the issues that you addressed um, at Seven Stages, what are, what are, you know, the one or two issues that you feel the proudest of in terms of we dealt with these social important issues from a theatrical viewpoint and we made a difference. What were some of you know the, the topics or the areas that right. you feel proudest for having addressed? I guess I would I would have to say the probably the first the top two would be race and the LGBT community. Those were the I mean we produced the first AIDS play ever done in America. And, uh, you know, there, there was some, I never claim that really because I say first or second usually because there was the other big one that was the musical that toured all around. But if you look at it, we're not quite sure who opened first, you know, but it was in that same year. So, so what year was that and tell us about it. Oh boy, what year was that? I have to get back to you on that year. Okay. Sorry. But it was, uh, it would have been before, no, it was somewhere between 84 and 87. Okay. And what was this play? Um, the play was, uh, Warren. And it was written by a woman named Rebecca Ranson. And uh, Warren had been her friend, and he had died of AIDS. He had been a leading member of the uh, Roots organization, which is regional organizations of theaters south, which still exists. And um, she wrote this play about, about him. I knew him, but I didn't know him very well, and she, they were really close. And so she wrote this play about his, his dying, really. And it was incredible because... The nurse was like wore these like little angel things that lit up, and he was so playful, and his lovers were there, and his family. It, it, he, you know, it was a death that I had, it, as it's portrayed, it was a death of dignity, surrounded by love and peace and tranquil, you know, everything that you would want for yourself. And this was, like I said, like eighty-five, maybe it, right at the very, very, very beginning of the epidemic, and. Um, People just wept, you know, it was just incredible. I mean, it was just such a beautiful piece, and, be, and, and also because it showed you how it could be. It does not have to be some other way, because we were also in a crisis where, I mean, we were having memorials. Oh, yeah, God. Um, we were having way too many memorials at the theater for people who were dying, and it was a real, it was a really, that was the crisis, you know, that took from then forward, but... Um, so yeah, that was a, was a that was a, and it was a successful run. Yes, it was a very successful. Run. And what was the other play you said? You say the first or second. What was the other AIDS? Play is it know? heart something? The normal heart. Yeah. Normal was it Larry Crane? Not, yeah, uh, not, uh, not Larry Crane. Uh, um, no. But I think is I know you're talking yeah. about yes, but the normal heart. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned LGBT, and then you mentioned race as the sort of topic areas that you felt best about. Well, the, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, it's weird, because I, I feel like I would, there were other issues that, yeah. you know, I would like to have done a lot more with, um, like, feminist issues, um, and tried to tie them into that human rights issue, you know, try to, it's about human rights, not about, like, women, or, you know, and, and tried to make it a bigger subject. But with race, you know, um, Atlanta is a very, very black city, and there, 
I don't, I, I feel that theater, if, you, if I look out there and I see, you know, 60% African American population, then why am I doing shows with only white people in it? It doesn't make sense. You know, life, you should be, it should be life. And, um, and so there were, that's what was possible. I mean, for us to, to see that as, a, as an important issue, we, we worked in, um, we worked with South African playwrights and we did a lot of work with Apple Fugard, um, who, you know, also was in, who was here with us? Adam Small was came. He was a he's a real social activist uh, in in the anti-apartheid movement, and worked with Steve Biko and um, and so we did some of his plays and um, so we explored. We tried to ex one of the plays that of Adam's was called The Orange Earth, which is something that they call South Africa. And uh, turns out that there's a man in jail. He's going to his death. He's on death row, and there's one guard. It's only well, there's a couple other people, but they're the two main characters. And turns out that they're both from the same little country town somewhere. And even though the one's black and one's white, well, guess what? His mother made some kind of cornbread or something, just like his mother did. And then they had this regional things and. That you see them coming from absolute hatred of each other to the humanity that exists between both of them, you know. And um, this woman never knew her before. Just she was like a tourist in Atlanta, and she had seen Sarafina at the Fox, you know. And then she had come to see us, and she said, you know, in Sarafina you could just sit there in the dark and escape, but not here, not here, because you had to be involved because you were so close. You just couldn't, you know, sit back and watch, so to speak. And so, I mean. I can't even remember how many plays that, that we've done that involved race. Now, you, you said there were uh, you know, feminist issues or other issues you'd like to address. When, talk to me about the process of how you would plan a season or think about what were the issues that we wanted to address in our upcoming season. Was it serendipity in terms of what came across your desk, or did you actively say, this season we want to deal with race or we want to deal with X no. or Y. No, we never really said it like that. No, no. I think that um, Ellen Stewart from La Mama is our um, spiritual mother. And she influenced us tremendously, as she did for most, most of the uh, theater world. Um, and one of the first things that she told us was that, you know, don't, don't deal with properties. You know, you're working with artists. And so that we thought that was really a, an interesting way to do it. And so we worked with artists. Some of the shows were developed by a group of artists. Um, some of them were written by playwrights that we knew or we had come across that we felt were, were interesting, who were writing interesting things. Um, a lot of those people were you know, either local people or national writers. We, um, and, we, and then we sort of had a network of people, of other artists that we knew who knew artists, and it all kind of, you know, we, in, in 84, we had a wonderful grant from the Goethe Institute thanks to Uta Bautasin, and um, we went to Germany, Dell and I went there for two and a half months, and first we had a language intensity uh, intensive, and then we traveled around at the cost of the German government to see anybody we wanted to see, like Boto Strauss, uh, Her Herzog, Werner Herzog, I mean, anybody, it was just amazing, and we got to see all this incredible theater, and made several friends, and, and still to the, the, this day have those friends. Um, and that influence, I think, was um, really huge. And we did this play called Achtenbusch. Uh, no, sorry, it's called The Frog by Achtenbusch. And um, it was very German, takes place in Bavaria, and it was a, a comedy. And uh, Werner Herzog's sister, Sigrid Herzog, directed it for us. And we just saw her again at a theater festival in Tel Aviv this past December, which was like, oh, my God, you know. Um, but anyway, it was interesting because it's about the Bavarians and the Prussians. And to make a very long story short, the southern people loved it because they, they had this sense that it was about the north, you know, and so it, and they go, how did that play in Atlanta? I said, it played great. They got it, you know. Um, we also did this play called Hondo Gothic, which was written by an African-American man whose name I cannot remember for the life of me at the moment. Uh, but he did, he did a sitcom sort of play about white redneck people. And I played this, like, waitress who smoked cigarettes and, you know, it was just very, very country. And it was so funny because people, white people, hated it. But black people thought it was hilarious and they loved it. You know, because you don't know how you see or how you're seen by others, you know. So that was interesting. Like, When was that, roughly? That was about probably 89 or so, because we were already in the other space then, by then. So maybe early 90s, something like that. So. And we did a lot, and we've done so much work 
internationally, that's... Yeah, I, 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 that's one thing I wanted to touch on because I've seen in, in the information you gave, the list of the countries that you guys have worked in. Did that just sort of come about or did you guys... Came about. Just think, we want to go international. We want to get international influences into our work. Well, what happened was, truthfully, this, this grant from the Goethe Institute that sent us to Germany, that was in 84. And that was the, sort of the first... Yeah, that was the first real exposure to European... And then, oh my God, it was, you, you know, you're done after that. You can't go back. You know, it's just, it's just such a different world there. And, and, of course, at that time... Oh my God! The theaters had like 400 employees, and people, you, it was a civil service job. You got a retirement and pension and health benefits, and we're like, where are we? And you know, people would I would say I'm Schauspielerin, you know, which is actress in German, and they went, oh, that's such a it's an oh pleasure to meet you, and you know, it, you're already like my friend says, artists get a pass, you know. So um, anyway, that that part of it was just. You know, incredible. And um, I remember there's a Woody Allen film, and there's just one little, one little clip in it. And he, they're at a party, and this guy goes, "Well, I'm an actor." And Woody Allen goes, "Oh, really? What restaurant do you work in?" <laughs> Never happened in Germany or France or, you know, any place like that. So, yeah, we were very lucky uh, to have those connections. And you know, it started out with the Germans, and then we knew they knew somebody, and then we, and honestly, we. We were working with this Polish director who had a guy who was actually of Polish descent, but he lived in, in Jalapa, Mexico, and he had a, a place called Studio X. And so somehow or other, we ended up with, you know, collaborating on a piece with him, and some of his company came. And the Germans, occasionally, we were wealthy enough to bring in some actors from some of the state theaters in Germany. And um, you know. How were you able to finance your travels? Because I know that you and Dell traveled... A lot, a lot. for some of that. Um, yeah. I, I don't have the list of the I will be, I'll be totally honest with you. Uh, we were very lucky because we've had airline support uh, for pretty much most of our history up until recently. In the early days, we would get free business class flights from Lufthansa. And that was just part of their cultural, you know, what they did culturally. They had certain tickets that were available for for artists, and we worked in Holland for five years, and we were bringing uh, three Dutch companies here, and they were having a five-city tour, like New York, Baltimore, Atlanta, uh, Philly, someplace, I don't remember, anyway, and so we had tickets from KLM, and then uh, we, in the good old days, uh, we had uh, tickets from Delta, international tickets. We, I think the last time we got the tickets, we got like something, I want to say like 20 international flights and 30 domestics. I mean, that's what kind of support we were getting. And then for the German work, uh, like we, we did this play called Carmen Kittel. And it's a very, it won like the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. And it's very interesting because in the German hierarchy, you know, he, this guy started out like as a technician and won the Pulitzer Prize in theater. I don't remember the name of it, sorry. Uh, which is, so that was very unusual. And um, we were best friends and we still are very close friends with the publisher and editor of Theater Heute, which is the German theater magazine. And um, he knew a woman, Laura, who um, was Laura the Red. They used to call her because she was known as a communist. You know? um, and uh, anyway, so he said, oh, she'd be the perfect director for this. You know? So we end up with this amazing director. And I, I, you know, it just happened because... It was, it was a, and, we, and the way we got Laura was because we were going for this man named Gerard. And um, he was a chronic smoker. I mean, a, what do we call Chain smoker. Chain smoker. And so he wanted something. He said, you'll have to build me like a Pope mobile so I can sit in the theater and smoke. And we're going, you can smoke in our theater. I don't even care if you're in a Pope mobile. <laughs> anyway, so we ended up with Laura. And, 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 you know, life is just so perfect, you know, in a way. And, yeah, my, we, yeah. anyway, I could just wow, go wow. on forever. <laughs> so if you sort of just step back, if you had not been working there, um, in your rehearsal when Dell walked in to measure the theater mm -hmm. back in 1978, and he hadn't entered your life, and for some reason, seven stages had not been formed, what do you think he would have done? No idea. No idea. <laughs> I really don't. I don't have any Was idea. there any time during your um, tenure with seven stages where you just sort of felt you were at the end of your rope, like, okay, I, being in the arts, 
despite all its positives, I'm just, I'm over it or I'm done. Was there ever a point where you just felt like you were at the end of your rope? Yeah, I, I think that there was. I can't, you know, it, I don't know how deep it was, or, um, but it seemed to always cycle out. You know, there never, I don't know whether it was the next new project that came up that was interesting or, you know, the possibility of, oh, I'm going to go to work in Paris. Okay, well, what am I upset about, you know, or. Um, so there's not, not one major incident that you really just sit. Yeah. That's, that's a blessing yeah. for no. you. Yeah, oh, oh, totally. I think if, the, if there was anything, it would be the day-to-day -day grind of it, you know, that, that wears you down. And by that I mean, because you're working, uh, you know, you're also running a business. So you're, you spend a lot of time writing grants and press releases and marketing and doing the books and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, if you're a very small company, you, you wear a lot of hats. And so that can become very um, exhausting. And I would say that that was probably what drove us to be tired more than the arts, you know, this, and the struggling and the way that the money, uh, the struggling for money is just got, gets worse and worse and worse, not better. And so that's, you know, you're trying to reinvent yourself all the time. You wanted to be very agile and uh, quick. <laughs> so, so it, but, you know, there's never been a dull moment, let me put it that way. So. <laughs> Where do you see the Atlanta theater scene right now compared to when you started? Interesting. There's a lot more theater, obviously. There are many more companies working and uh, lots of places, you know, people have their niche like Aurora Theater and, you know, everybody, you know, the dad's garage and, um, <clears throat> but there's, uh, there's not a lot of support and by support I mean money, you know. Um, you know, you go to other cities or other countries and you just, I mean, for example, Ireland has a higher arts budget than the National Endowment for the Arts in America. And why do you see so many Irish plays on Broadway? And why are the Irish known for their theater? Well, because somebody's putting money into it, you know. And I'm not talking even about a lot of money. I'm talking about, like, go back to the days of Ronald Reagan even, you know. I mean, it, it's just the, the climate in this country is just so polarized. And so, and for some reason, artists are, I don't know, the enemy. I think they're viewed as expendable. Well, that's true, too. But also that they're dangerous, that there's something dangerous about them, that they're Especially theater like us, you know, we're calling things out. Like, you know, Susan Booth is a, is a, a very good friend of Dell's and, and an acquaintance of mine. Um, and, like, we've talked to her about doing international projects and different Oh, no, I can't. My board wouldn't let me. No, I can't do that. I have to do stuff that's family-oriented. And, you know, she does these projects, like, with Disney and some other places, uh, big, big, rich theaters, so that they can, you know, be successful and share costs. And, I mean, that used to not be the case, you know, people, but, I mean, everybody is struggling at their, at whatever level they're at, but if you're already at the bottom, you know, <laughs> there's not more, a lot, you How can How do you cut. see this evolving? Are you optimistic? I don't really know, to tell you the truth. I'm optimistic with, uh, with the people, and uh, I, I think that uh, individuals are going to, if, if they want art to continue, I mean, because if you look at, really look at New York, I mean, there are so many foundations, so many people are giving money, not just the corporations, but, and the same is true in Atlanta, I think if people want art, they're going to have to step up to the plate and, and say, we want this, you know, I mean, we spend, I don't know exactly, we spend something like two cents a person on, on uh, the National Endowment. You know, I think in, in Holland, uh, they don't have a, they used to say they don't have a safety net, they have a safety couch. I mean, you know, I mean, people were spending 50 cents a person. But what's the difference between 2 cents and 50 cents, you know? But I know people say to me all the time, well, why, why can't you be more like sports? They don't need grants. I said, who do you think builds the stadium? Who do you think pays for all that? That's our tax money. The infrastructure, the, the train station that stops right at the ballpark, all that stuff, you know, that, but they don't, people don't see that like that. You know, they think it's... And they, I mean, they took it out of the schools. They took art out of the schools. That, that's interesting because I, I, just as an aside, that's how I think people, and that's how I got started going to the theater is you went with your school trip. Right. And so I, 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 I guess I, well, I'd like to ask you, with the arts being cut back in the schools, how do you see theaters here in Atlanta or, or what might they do to try to get kids into the habit of going of to the going theater. In. Well, it's it's complicated. For us, we've had very, very successful, um, we had a company called YEA, which is still a, a successful company here. It's a 
30 or so member African American ensemble company. And what does YEX stand for? Youth Ensemble of Atlanta. And uh, they, they, were, they are and were phenomenal people. Uh, their school, they created uh, not only artists, but created an audience. Like they have, we have still kids who went through that program, you know, back in the 90s and still come to the theater. Uh, at one point, four of them were on Broadway at the same time. And Sa and Gauja, who came through YEA, was playing Fela. He played it on Broadway, he played it in London and in Paris. And, you know, I mean, that's, uh, it's a success story, shall we say. And, you know, they came up through seven stages. We have the same thing now. We have another company called Youth Creates. And um, same thing is happening. All those kids, like, they volunteer in the office. They go on to, um, you know, to college and get careers and work professionally and, um, those who stay around town work with us in any capacities that they can. So I think in that way, we're, we're helping to create an audience and, and artists, but it's very hard. And, and also Atlanta does not have any kind of, um, there's no Juilliard here. You know, you get to go to, well, I think you've closed your theater department here, haven't you? I think they have. Yeah, because I had some students uh, who were going here who now don't go. But anyway, um, and I think the same as University of Georgia is, uh, they're not like, filling positions, you know, once people go away, uh, everybody's it's shrinking. But, you know, isn't that only a perception? And now you ask me what I mean by that. Uh, the world is how you look at it sometimes, you know. I see these positive young faces and these kids are so excited in there. And I'm totally optimistic, you know. I, I, I just go, yes, yes, this is what we want. This is what we need. All of us need it for our soul. You know, Bread and Puppet used to say, you know, art is food for the soul. Anyway, and then, you know, if I look at my bank account, then I go, ugh. <laughs> but, uh, they're not really measurable or comparable. How successful did you think, because I, I was reading back over um, Seven Stages' mission statement in one of the documents you gave, and the mission statement spoke about um, seeking audiences who have an interest in social, political, and spiritual things, and trying to expand their their perceptions of that and getting them to take action. How successful do you think Seven Stages has been in terms of, of helping and uh, empower your audiences then to go and take action on the issues that you're presenting? I think that we've always spoken about actually not taking that last step um, to motivate them to act. We hope that they act, but mostly we just want them to think. We want to say, I want somebody to go, oh, oh, really? Is that what's going on? You know, ah, I never, you know. They have that kind of, like the, the guy who went back to his Christian group and, and talked to them about Turner, you know. And so he did take action. But, well, sometimes I think, you know, somebody even 10 years later or whatever could think, you know, they still keep thinking about something, you know. It's, I don't know. I mean, that's a big responsibility. And um, I think we've done our best, but I don't know that I can... Follow them to this picket line, you know. I don't that I don't know. That's good. Um, two things, because we we have maybe about ten minutes left. One, I wanted to, to loop back, and, and we're going to talk to Dell individually, and then ultimately we're going to have you two together that as well. That'll be so much fun. Um, and we'll get more into that then. But I did want to to touch on just very quickly the fact that you had three wedding ceremonies. You mentioned. <laughs> Um, Three and is a magic the, number. Right, and the last one being on the stage there at Seven Stages, mm -hmm. and I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, what that meant to you and the symbolism of that and sort of what um, what that gave you spiritually to do that in, an, in, a, in a, a venue where so much of your professional life had mm -hmm. occurred. It was perfect, absolutely perfect. I mean, I had, I had my, I wanted a hoopa, hoopa, and you know, because we needed, because I'm a set designer, right, so we needed to have something to, and a hoopa is, it's a, it's a, it's like a white uh, sort of cloth, it's like a little tent, it's from, it's usually used in traditionally in Jewish ceremonies, okay. um, 
I kept saying, are you Jewish? No, I just want a hoopah. Um, anyway, but what, so because it's, I'm, a light des- I'm in a set designer, so I said, okay, what do we do? We need something there for the ceremony, but then it needs to go away so people can party and, right, and we can have the catering and everything. And so we just, I said, a hoopah would be perfect because you just bring it in and then we have rigs so we could rig it back up, you know, and it went perfect. It was just, you know, that, so that worked really well. And But also the lighting design was just gorgeous you know my god it was so atmospheric and beautiful and then um we were in costuming I mean Del was in a really nice tux and I think he had about 15 women who were his brideswomen um and they were like some were vampire they had worn their vampire costumes from Dracula which meant they were more or less topless with just sheer and then some of the others were burlesque you know women with stripes and black skirts that went like this and everything all hanging out and so he had about 15 of those, and then and I had about maybe 10 really young, gorgeous male musicians and just different people that we work with, you know. So that was really fun. And then I had two young, young girls who were my bridesmaids. No one gave me away, of course, because I don't belong to anyone. Um, so, but I had these young women, and they were like 24, and they had been in a Christmas show, and they had these little sexiest little angel costumes you've ever seen, a little goldy glitter bra and a little tiny white wrap skirt with a gold like tie belt on it and little angel wings. So they were my bridesmaids. And, you know, that that was really funny, half naked bridesmaids and um and the, I had all these musicians and all these singers and I mean it was just rich with and it was that they loved us so much. There was so much community like, oh my God. I mean people waited in line to hug us and just like, oh my God, I was just you know, you guys have meant so much to us and oh, I can't believe you're so mad. And it's just I mean, it was beautiful. I don't mean to make it sound like it. What it was just incredible. And gifts. I'd asked this one woman if she. I had sung years ago in a in a play that Del wrote, um, La Vie en Rose. So it's very corny, but it means a lot to me. And um, so I asked Dorothy if she would sing it for me. And she doesn't speak French, and she didn't know the song. And she said, "Yes, I'll do anything for you." You know. And then she sang the most beautiful rendition. And this other woman, Naomi, sang um, "Glad There Was You," the Ella Fitzgerald. That was our in quotes first dance. And um, you know, so it, I just felt, I have, can't tell you how much love I, I felt from all those people. And like a reviewer who had been a creative loafing like 20 years ago was there. I mean, people from my past, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty sensational. And like I said, they just, how much everybody really cared for us and how much they, they thought we had done for them, which is interesting. Because that's what people say all the, oh, you don't know, you changed my life. You, like, really? Is is there anything that you want to do, either professionally or personally, from a, a, a big project standpoint that you haven't done yet? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. No, I don't think there's anything really big out there that I, I... I've written some plays. I might dabble in that a little bit. I'm working on another play with Del and Robert Earl right now. I know we were in, just in Maryland doing that. And, um, you know, right now we're organizing a... Um, a piece called Blue Planet with Da Theater and Art Institute of Chicago and Art Space, which is uh, Art Spot in New Orleans. And that's going to be a big project and that will tour here in the States and internationally uh, in Europe. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. We start that in January. So what is, t- t- talk to me just as we wrap things up about your current role at Seven Stages. Since you guys have sort of transitioned out of the management stuff, are you, um, I don't know, uh, doing stuff on a sort of a project basis? Or are you still there every day? Or? Oh, no, it's more of a project basis. Like, uh, we officially kind of left our management positions on July 1, but on June 26th, I, we drove up to Maryland, to the eastern shore of Maryland, to work on this script, and which will be then produced at, at Washington College, where we were working, and then also at seven stages, and then hopefully it will have a life of its own, and that will all, you know, that's all going to, go, that's all going through seven stages, you know. But as the writers, we're working on the project, sort of with seven stages, so to speak, and the same with the, um, the Blue Planet. It's, uh, you know, we're doing all the organizing of it, and um, then it will be with seven stages. You know, the seven stages will host it, and we have a, we have a history. We started going to Belgrade during the war. Um, which, which, really interesting stuff to talk about as well, but probably don't have the time for visiting the refugee camps and uh, working with people there. And are you, is that going to be involved with this Blue Planet? Mm-hmm. 
in what way? Uh, they're the, they're going to be the, like, these four companies will create it. Deanna Milosevic is the artistic director of DAW, and she will be the director. Um, and Dell and I will be actors, and they have an acting company there as well. Uh, and then we have some people coming from New Orleans, and um, then Ruth and um, Ruth McGrath and Nikos, sorry, I can't remember his last name, will be coming from the Art Institute in Chicago, and we'll create this piece. It's about, uh, what can I say it's about? That's a silly way to, but Deanna, we were, were going to do another Eric N. play, which because we've done some of those. We did one about the genocide in Rwanda. It was a very, very powerful um, piece. And people, like so many R Rwandans here, in a, a expat, you know, here in, living in, in Atlanta, who knew they would come and sit in the front row and cry. And some woman would brought her children, but she sat in the lobby. And what was the title of the play? Maria Casito. And uh, Maria Casito was a, was a nun, young woman, who literally participated in the genocide. And the generals were all leaving, and she said, oh, no, you missed somebody. They're hiding in the garage. You may have heard the stories. I saw the show. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> nice. That's so nice. Um, but anyway, so Deanna, who had been working in Belgrade and all the, you know, they started in 91 as a, uh, a, a, a to, to protest against Milosevic and the war. And so um, and that's, okay, this is 2013 now. And she just said, I just can't do any more war and genocide. I, I want to do something else. Let's do something else. And so we came up with this idea about, you know, how people do come together in crises and different situations and can make things better, human beings coming together, what an idea. And, you know, they, like for example, in the great Chicago, um, San Francisco fire, there was like no food and everything was like burnt to the ground. And this one woman um, opened this something called the mitzvah cafe. And obviously she's Jewish because mitzvah is Jew, Hebrew for like a gift. And so she had all the food that she had. She tried to cook it up as best she could and she just put it out on this little you know, and started feeding people, right? Well, then the neighbor next door had food, and they came in. And so everybody was, like, getting along, and it was all going, like, really, really well. Unfortunately, then the military showed up, and they wanted, you know, more. Right? So they even shot uh, one shopkeeper going in his own store. Yeah. Anyway, but so, so to sort of try to do something that is powerful and positive in, in a way, and it can be sort of funny, also, I mean, it can be humorous, I think, that can, um, you know, we could show the world as, as, well, what if, you know, there is this group called the Yes Men, and they do this, they, they make phony IDs and stuff, and they go into, like, a corporate boardroom and start saying, well, that oil is bad, and we're not, I'm oversimplifying it, but they start, like, undermining what they're talking about, and then all of a sudden people, like, start to catch on, you know, and then they, like, wow. <laughs> yeah, there was also, like, a newspaper that was printed. And it said, like, the war in Afghanistan is over and the economy, you know, so it's just sort of playing with those, those kinds of ideas. It's gotcha. interesting. All right, the last thing I wanted to ask you before we wrapped up is, and it's, it's still fairly recent, I'd obviously, if you just uh, sort of transitioned on July 1 out of day-to-day -day -day management, day -day yeah. management, and now it's July 25th, 2013. Um, what kind of emotions are you feeling in this transition, mm -hmm. given that that's been over 30 years of your life? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, for me, it has been very, um, very hard. You know, I, I think of, this, like, I was just talking to my friend, she's a retired school teacher, and she's I hope I never see that school again. Well, I don't feel that way. It's like my child, Seven Stages, you know? Um, I would do everything I could to help Seven Stages and love Seven Stages. And so I didn't walk away. I don't, with any, you know, any malice of thought or any, you know, it was just, in order to survive, the theater financially can't afford Dell and I anymore. That's the truth. And I mean, uh, if I, I can't, I don't want to work 60, 70 hours a week anymore. And so it's not fair to the theater. They have to have somebody younger who can do that. So, but it's very bittersweet. You know, I, like I, I keep saying, and I'm not used to it yet, because, like I said, the end of June, I just went to Maryland for three weeks, so I'm only here like a week now, and I, and I, I said it's weird. I don't have to go to the theater, you know. Really? I call up Mac. I go, Mac, it's so weird not being there. Is everything okay? Is what's going on? You know? And of course, they're all up to here, and you know, with every, yeah, okay. <laughs> You know, and right now we have our um, our youth creates program, so we've got like thirty teenagers running around there, and it's just bedlam. I mean, it's fantastic, but it is insane. We've got six kids from the Netherlands and four from Israel, 
we always try to have some international influence, and so that's pretty interesting. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's. I think I don't know that I even know it yet. You know what it means to not be there, because like I say, it's been it's just so recent. But it's definitely bittersweet. I don't want to do some of the stuff. Like I don't want to write press releases or do payroll or write grants, but, you know, I don't really want to do that anymore. I never wanted to do it. I mean, that was a joke, because I was so naive. I said, okay, we'll start a theater, and, you know, I'll be an actor and a designer, like, 90% of the time, and then I'll do the other stuff 10% of the time. Well, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. You know, you really only get to do the art. That's that's the cherry on top. You know, if you keep the doors open, you can you can do the art. But, uh, yeah. I think it's the greatest place on earth seven stages and I tell you you know you can you go to New York and like Charles one of the guys who works with us and he was just talking to some theater pe person and they went oh god seven stages I love that theater that's the greatest theater Del Hamilton and Faye Allen and, and it's like you know I mean people other people like they like we had this great time we did a, a play with um oh gosh what's his name one of the one of the uh, beat poets Michael McClure and um it was called General Gorgeous, it was called. Anyway, so right after that, I get a call. It's on my voicemail. I go in. The, the show's closed like about a week. And he goes, hi, this is Alan Ginsberg. And my friend Michael said he just had a blast down there with you guys. And I'm going to be with The Clash on tour before I go to Nicaragua. And we're going to come right through Atlanta. Can we do something at your theater? I said, yeah. First of all, I didn't believe it. I said, I have to listen to that again. Is that really Alan Ginsberg? You know? And it was. And we were packed to the rafters. So what, what was the show? What oh, did he, they do? he just he did a poetry reading. And then the Clash played. Did yeah, they well, play? no, no, no. The Clash was at the Fox. Oh, okay. And okay. he was just with them. He was hanging uh, out oh, with them. Oh, okay. I was thinking. The so. Clash didn't come to Seven Stages. No, oh, we were not bad. big enough. We were just on more. We were still okay. in a little space. Okay. But uh, he and his partner, well, I forget his name. They were partners forever. Anyway, um, he played like some rhythm, and then Allen Ginsberg um, just did his poetry. Wow, it's fun. What a great story to end on. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Faye. Sure. Um, that's it. We're gonna